Welcome on behalf of the Company of Merchant Adventurers of the City of York to this Science Discovery Talk in partnership with the University of York. Under normal circumstances, you would be hearing tonight's talk while seated in the majestic surroundings of our hall. That, of course, is not currently possible. So, if I may, I would like to give you a feeling of what you're missing whilst giving some context to this talk. As you will be aware, its subject is the future of our oceans. The relationship for this company with the sea has always been a very important one. It is perhaps surprising to some that York used to be a significant maritime trading hub, even though our city is inland and far from the North Sea. During the medieval period, ships sailed from the staiths of York along the River Ouse onto the Humber and then to London, other English ports and overseas to Europe. The main export was woolen cloth, whilst goods such as wine, iron, wood, dyes, fur, salt, as well as fish would be unloaded and sold in the busy markets of York and further afield. The importance of our oceans and their impact on maritime trade and commerce flow through the company's history like the two rivers that run through the city of York. They're inextricably linked. Its importance can be highlighted by its inclusion on our coat of arms, represented by the wavy blue lines signifying a body of water. In the 14th century, York merchants came together to build our current hall to serve the joint purpose of being a place of business, of worship and charity. The hall itself sits on Fosgate, a street named after the river it crosses. From, with Roman origins and a later Viking settlement, Fosgate, and more specifically its bridge, was also home to York's fish and seafood market. The market would open on the ringing of the Scatty Bell at 11 a.m. with traders coming from as far as field as Whitby, some 50 miles away, to ply their trade. The hall is unique because it is the oldest surviving semi-timbered guild hall in Britain with its three principal rooms still intact. More remarkable still, it has remained all this time in the ownership of the organisation that built it 660 years ago. The building took four years to construct and has three main rooms designed to serve the basic functions of a medieval guild. The Great Hall, on the upper level, was used for business, for meetings and for the company's social events, and still is. The Undercroft was used for charitable purposes, as a hospital or almshouse to help the sick and the poor. The third room, the chapel, was, and is, for religious services. The company has a long and prestigious history in promoting enterprise and commercial venturing, business risk-taking. A merchant adventurer was quite simply a merchant who risked his or her own capital in pursuit of trade, both here in England, but also around the ports of the North Sea and the Baltic. Today, our membership of men and women is taken from a more broad church of entrepreneurs, businessmen, academics and professionals. They have a common set of values through their fellowship, preserving the hall and its contents and pursuing their collective ambition of helping business enterprise and education. Our support of tonight's talk is consistent with those aims. I would now like to ask the University Vice-Chancellor, Professor Charlie Jeffrey, to introduce tonight's speaker. Many thanks, Governor, uh, and good evening, everybody. I'm Charlie Jeffrey, Vice-Chancellor of the University of York, uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker for this evening's Science Discovery Lecture, Dr. Bryce Stewart. 
The annual Science Discovery Lecture has proved enormously popular and successful. Tonight's is the 25th in a stimulating and thought-provoking series. Organised jointly by the University and the Merchant Adventurers, these lectures help inform the people of York about important scientific discoveries made by academics at the University. At the same time, they demonstrate how such discoveries are applied for the benefit of our society. This lecture is also part of York Ideas, the University of York's year-long series of events to educate, entertain and inspire. This culminates in the York Festival of Ideas in June each year. As a university for public good, based in a city of ideas and innovation, our commitment is to engage with as diverse a set of audiences as we can, and to do what we can to widen participation in education. This has been a particularly challenging year for all of us. So we're especially pleased to be able nonetheless to bring you this lecture in an online format. Sadly, we can't meet in person and give you an opportunity to meet our speaker in the wonderful surroundings of the Merchant Adventurers Hall, as we normally would, but we hope that you'll enjoy the talk all the same. On which note, it's my great pleasure to say a few words about our speaker, Dr. Bryce Stewart. Bryce is a member of staff in the University's Department of Environment and Geography, a leading centre for teaching and research on sustainable solutions to the world's environmental issues. Its world leading research encompasses topics of global environmental importance and ranges across the natural and social sciences, everything from atmospheric chemistry to environmental policy analysis. Bryce is a marine ecologist and fisheries biologist whose research exemplifies both the excellence and the relevance of the department. It engages with issues of climate change, overfishing, plastic pollution, and Brexit. And in the last few years, Bryce has been the media's go-to person to comment on such topics as the Anglo-French scallop wars, which flare up from time to time. The central goal of his research has been to understand better the factors regulating marine populations and communities so as to ensure their conservation and sustainable use. Since 2016, he's been particularly involved in assessing the potential effects of Brexit on UK fisheries and the marine environment, working with a wide range of stakeholders and advisors. In his talk tonight on ocean optimism, Bryce will speak about how Whilst the threats our oceans face are undoubtedly real, scientists, conservationists, and coastal communities are slowly turning the tide. Thank you very much, Charlie. That's a wonderful introduction. And thanks very much to the Merchant Adventurers for inviting me here this evening. So I will just put my presentation on. The topic of my talk this evening is ocean optimism and is there really hope for the oceans? As Charlie said, I'm in the Department of Environment and Geography at the University of York. If you do wish to get in touch, you can email me here. And I'm also quite active on Twitter at BD Stew. So this is uh, Versova Beach in Mumbai. Um, and as I said, this young lawyer, um, Afro Shah, uh, moved here in 2015. And he decided to do something about all of this litter on, on the beach. And so every day, for six weeks, he, he spent about an hour or so cleaning it up and uh, no one came to help him. And he thought it was a fairly futile effort, but he continued all the same. And finally, after about six weeks, one other person started to help. And then the whole thing slowly snowballed. And over the next three years, together, the community removed 5.3 million kilograms from this beach and ultimately, it ended up like we have on the right here. And what's even better than that is after those uh, three years and that big cleanup um, of, of the litter, 
For the first time in over 20 years, Olive Ridley sea turtles nested on this beach and 80 hatchlings were seen. So I just wanted to tell you that story just to show how the efforts of one person can really make a difference to the future of our oceans. And these sort of stories hopefully will inspire you to maybe do a little bit yourself. So I thought I would start my own story by going back to my youth. And I was born in Australia, but actually brought up in Papua New Guinea. And this, uh, these words here uh, are in Tokpisan, which is the language of New Guinea. It basically means, you know, um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You may be able to recognize this young chap here. Um, he was a little slimmer in those days. And I had a fa fabulous upbringing, um, doing all sorts of things to do with the ocean, sailing, fishing, snorkeling, and scuba diving. And I, I really developed a deep love of the ocean in those days. And my dad said to me, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a professional holiday man. And he said, well, that's not really a job, but you do love the sea. So maybe you could be a marine biologist. And that was it. I was hooked and I was determined. And uh, yeah, fortunately, I was able to make that, that dream a reality. However, the ocean is not quite what it was, even from when I was growing up there's been unfortunately a huge amount of negative effects because of human activity. So in terms of fishing, for example, we now know that about a third of fish stocks around the world are overexploited um, and over 60% are at their maximum capacity, being fished at their maximum capacity. We've lost a lot of the world's large predatory fish. So these are things like marlin and tuna, um, large cod, all of that sort of uh, type of species have disappeared in the last 50 years. There's high levels of bycatch like we see here and habitat disturbance from bottom, bottom toed fishing gear. And as a result, food webs are being disrupted um, and that's having effects right across marine communities. So the question is, you know, how will these already stressed out ecosystems cope with ongoing threats from things like climate change and ocean acidification, and of course, growing human populations. So ocean warming, as we know, is a, a, you know, a huge issue, um, not just the sort of steady increase, but something that's becoming even more of a problem are these extreme events, heat waves, which for example, you know, destroyed large parts of the Great Barrier Reef um, over the last five or six years. We've also got the issue of ocean acidification. And for those not familiar, this is also caused by carbon dioxide, but a lot of the carbon dioxide which heats the atmosphere is also absorbed by the ocean. And that is making the ocean more acidic. And that has uh, causes problems for all sorts of things that form calcium structures like corals, like many shellfish and even quite a lot of plankton. And then, of course, there's plastic pollution. So I think many people now, a lot more than there maybe was in the past, are um, familiar with this issue of plastic pollution, thanks to the efforts of many people, but especially the wonderful David Attenborough. And, you know, unfortunately, I've seen a lot of this um, firsthand from my time, uh, spending a lot of time at sea and by the sea. This photo here of mine was actually taken in the Seychelles. It was interesting to note that it looks like I have the same bottle that David Attenborough um, found on the Great Barrier Reef. Probably not the exact same one, but it shows how ubiquitous these things are. Unfortunately, plastic pollution can cause some fairly terrible things. This is a photo taken on the coast um, just off, uh, down from York, and this is a seal that's been tangled in a fishing net. So. It is a really ongoing problem. Um, the Alan MacArthur Foundation has done some research into this and said by the year 2050, there'll be more plastic in the, than fish in the oceans. So it's definitely worth keeping an eye out for plastic pollution. That is a real photo. I found that plastic eye on the beach uh, in Southern England. Um, yeah, keeping an eye out for plastic pollution whenever you're out by the sea and, and cleaning it up as best you can. So the ocean faces many challenges, but it's also really important to us. It provides, you know, more than half of the oxygen that we breathe. It provides 
global routes for shipping, as we heard in the introduction. Um, it provides a huge amount of well-being, uh, you know, what's called blue mind, but of course it also provides a lot of food. And so we need our fisheries. In fact, fish provides over 3 billion people with over 20% of their daily protein needs. That's, you know, not far short of half of the world's population. Just in the UK, our fish landings are worth um, at first sale almost a billion pounds per annum and the fishing industry and processing industry employs over 25,000 people, often in places in coastal communities where there aren't many other options. And even recreational fishing is, is really important. It's considered to be worth almost two billion pounds per year to the um, UK economy um, and employs again, you know, over 16,000 people and over a million people go sea angling every year. Unfortunately, the state of the ocean is hard to visualize for a lot of people. There is this issue of out of sight, out of mind. You know, if fish stocks are going down around our coast, we don't really see it in the supermarkets because seafood is, is the most globally traded commodity. And uh, if it runs out here, it'll just be sort of brought in from elsewhere. And this somewhat, I guess, um, you know, uh, un unfortunate view of the marine environment and this lack of awareness about it is really illustrated in this study done a few years ago. So over half of the English public surveyed in this work thought their local patch of sea was barren and the sea was dirty and murky and that effectively there was no public awareness of the English undersea landscape as a place. Most people kind of thought when they thought about what was sort of spectacular under the water, they thought about coral reefs, you know, places far, far away. And so the conclusion was that it would be very difficult to get the British public engaged in marine conservation efforts. So I was quite concerned about this at the time and I've continued to be. I mean, I, I am Australian, but I'm also very proud of my second home here in the UK. And I really want people to get more engaged with the underwater world. So when I was first putting this talk together, I put a call out on Twitter for pictures of the um, British underwater landscape and species to try and inspire people. And I got some absolutely fantastic contributions. So this is the Isles of Scilly, for example. I mean, that surely looks like a beautiful coral reef, as good as anything you could see anywhere in the tropics. Um, some wonderful other species, some cuttlefish. This is from down on the south coast of England. Tom Pot Blenny. We have a wrasse here, for example. Um, and lots of other wonderful photos came flooding in. This is a cowrie. Again, you know, most people think this is a tropical species, but we indeed have a species here in the UK. And on it goes. You know, we have the, the um, fireworks anemone hermit crabs, octopus, even a place uh, which most people probably think of, you know, only in the fish and chip shop or in the supermarket is actually a, a beautiful species underwater. This is something a little bit different that was sent to me, um, just sort of shows how amazing marine creatures are. This is actually the same individual half an hour later. So this crab has molted, that's its original shell, and half an hour later, it's grown this new shell, which is five centimeters wider and obviously almost twice the size in volume. So it's an extraordinary way of growing. And then finally, it's worth saying for those in the audience from uh, York or Yorkshire, that we have some amazing marine life on our doorstep. So these are all photos that I've taken over the last few years. This is the Donanook uh, seal uh, rookery down on the Lincolnshire coast. This is Flamborough Head, which is a very biodiverse and unique area, has one of the only no-take fishing zones in the UK. We have the seabird colonies at Bempton Cliffs, and we even have uh, whales just off the coast of Whitby. So I, I thought this was a joke when I first <clears throat> moved here, and I, people said to me we could go whale watching, and I was like, surely we won't see anything. 
Well, I've been whale watching all over the world, and this was one of the best trips I've ever done. We, we saw over a dozen minke whales on, on a couple of hour evening cruise. So that it's all out there to see, to value, and hopefully to protect and manage better. So on that note, I thought I would now share with you um, some stories of successful marine management that I've personally been involved with in uh, since I've been in the UK over the last 20 years. And so I'll take you on a bit of a journey through my time here and, and yeah, the sort of more positive stories. So the first is the Isle of Man, and this is where I went to when I first arrived. Um, the Isle of Man, if you like scallops, is probably one of the best places in the world. So here's the Isle of Man, it's in the middle of the Irish Sea. And all of these pink areas around it are scallop fishing grounds. So scallops dominate the fisheries landings into the Isle of Man, but the fishery is, um, it appears sustainable, but it's much less productive than it used to be in the past. The main way they are caught is by um, dragging dredges along the seabed. And unfortunately that has reduced biodiversity and the sort of habitat complexity on the main fishing grounds. So in response to this, the Isle of Man back in 1989, pioneered the use of marine protected areas to try and improve fisheries sustainability. And the densities of scallops in this very first marine protected area off the Southwest coast have been monitored ever since. So the area was set up in 1989 um, and in 1999, that was when I arrived, Unfortunately, what this graph shows is that there hadn't been really a lot of recovery in terms of scallops. So the, the, the red line and the blue sort of jagged line is, is the number of scallops in the protected area and the pink line is in adjacent fishing ground. So I was sort of uh, just out of my PhD and I was asked to investigate this and see what could be done to improve the situation. And, and I didn't really understand that, but the problem was, as I soon become to realize, that there was a lot of illegal fishing in this protected area. So after trying a sort of slightly confrontational approach, or at least getting the authorities to sort of try and enforce the rules more directly, I eventually worked out that a much better way was to work directly with the fishermen and to go on board their boats and to charter their boats for our research and build up a rapport. And they began to support this area and support the research we were doing. And you can see the results, the numbers of scallops really took off. And so by 2006, we had 10 times as many in this protected area as on the fishing ground. Now the news gets even better than that because the, the scallops there are much bigger than uh, what's in the, in the fished area. So on the bottom here, we've got the sizes of different scallops and the, the height of the bars indicates the numbers of them. So you can see in the protected area, there's lots of these big scallops, many of which are completely non-existent in the fishing ground. And so they're building up biomass as well. In fact, there was 20 times more biomass or weight of scallops per unit area by 26 to 2006. Now this is good for the area itself, but actually the story is even better than that. And this is because of the way the scallops breed. So you've got lots of large scallops and they have proportionally larger gonads. This pink uh, or orange and white bit is, um, is the gonad, they're hermaphrodites. So the, the orange is the female and the white the male. And the bigger scallops produce a lot more eggs as well. In fact, per unit area, again, 33 times more um, in the protected area than on the fishing ground. They also breed by external fertilization. So they release their eggs and sperm into the water. They fertilize best if they're near each other. And because there were so many more scallops in the protected area, the fertilization rates were much better. And we actually modeled this and found out that per unit area, the scallops in the protected zone we're producing about a hundred times more baby scallops than on the fishing ground. And what this meant was that little protected area, which is just off this tip of the Isle of, uh, Isle of Man, 
was actually producing all of this larvae, all these baby scallops that were spreading out right across um, the west coast of the Isle of Man and out into the Irish Sea. So this tiny area was actually having a phenomenal effect on a much larger area. And of course, there were conservation benefits as well. Um, because the area wasn't being dredged, we saw increases in biodiversity. We saw more long-lived and fragile animals, um, more complex habitat. And then that provided actually nursery areas for um, the scallops themselves, but also many other species as well. So in response, um, the Isle of Man has really embraced this concept in the years since. And now they have a, an amazing network of protected areas right around the island. Um, they've even named a beer after it, the Marine Protected Area Ale. Well, that's what I think, but I might be a bit biased. It might actually mean Manx Pale Ale, but there you go. So moving on to my second success story, and some people uh, certainly in the UK may remember this, and this was a campaign run by Hugh Fernley Whittingstall on the problem of fisheries discards and the fact that in some fisheries, particularly in the North Sea, up to 50% of the fish were being thrown away because of the rules that were in place at the time. Now, I was uh, decided to do some research on this and, and how we might tackle this issue. And I looked at what was going on in Norway uh, with one of my students, Ben Diamond, because they had actually banned discarding of fish um, back in the late 1980s when their fisheries were in crisis. Now, when they did this, this graph here shows the profitability of the fishery. Um, and if it's either below, if it's below the line, then effectively they're losing money. If it's above, they're making money. And so when they first discarded, uh, banned the discards, there was a drop in the productivity. And so the fishermen did take a bit of a hit, but they were supported by their government. And in due course, the fisheries actually really recovered because those young fish were surviving now to, to maturity and there was a much better use of the resource. And nowadays their fisheries are some of the most prosperous in the world. Now, I was fortunate in that I had uh, met Hugh Fairley Whittingstall a few times and I was able to advise him um, on his campaign. And I was also in due course invited to speak to the fisheries committee in the European Parliament um, to help them. Some people may uh, notice this blonde headed gentleman. That's not Boris, that's actually Stanley Johnson, his father, who was uh, chairing this particular meeting. And this work combined with the work of many, many others eventually led uh, the European Parliament to adopt a discard ban as a measure. So it was introduced in a phased fashion originally in 2015. Um, and then over the next three or four years was eventually brought in in full by 2019. So it's still bedding in, it still hasn't achieved full success, but it's certainly on the right path to achieving more sustainable fisheries across the Northeast Atlantic. Moving on then, and this is a personal favorite, and this is the Isle of Arran. Um, and back in actually 1995, these two gentlemen, Howard Wood and Don McNeish, who are local residents on the Isle of Arran in Scotland, um, and also scuba divers, noticed a decline in the state of their local marine environment. And so they got together and decided to campaign to do something about it, to set up a no take zone, an area where fishing was banned to try and allow some recovery of the marine environment. And this is the area that was eventually settled on in Lamlash Bay. It's only about three kilometers squared, um, but after a long campaign that uniquely got the local community very much on side and they formed an organization called Coast Community of Aaron Seabed Trust, they were able to get the Scottish government to um, legislate for this no take zone. Now I first met Howard and Don back in 2003 and I helped them with their campaign. Um, but then after the area was actually designated, Howard got in touch and he said, look, no one's really monitoring this area, monitoring the recovery. So I had a very keen young student, Lee Howarth, uh, MSc student who wanted to do some scuba diving work in the UK. And so I sent him up there 
And Lee and Howard uh, did the first proper survey of this zone. And one of the first things they noticed was even after a couple of years, the seabed was really recovering inside the no-take zone. And there were lots of these baby scallops growing on all the algae and the other species that had started to recover on the seabed. Now these things are tiny, they're only about the size of a penny, but obviously they grow up into uh, an important commercial species. So on the back of this early work, um, the community of Arran campaigned for a much larger protected area, which eventually was designated in 2014, and then protected in a sort of zoned approach in 2016. So there's no scallop dredging allowed anywhere in the area. The green areas um, can be uh, trawled under certain conditions, but then all the yellow hatched area, there's no gear that's allowed to be towed on the seabed, only um, fishing with pots for crabs and lobsters and, uh, and diving if, if people want to do that. It wasn't easy, and I think it's fair to say that not everyone was a fan. So clearly, um, you know, the people who previously had scallop dredged in this area weren't quite so happy, but uh, an objection was raised in the Scottish Parliament, um, and there was a vote to decide whether or not to go ahead with this protection. And you, as you can see, things got fairly heated. But in the, in the end, uh, the um, committee voted to uphold the management regime. Um, and that is what's gone forward, you know, largely on the weight of the community support, of the, of the support from the local community. So we've continued to monitor this area. Uh, you don't need to sort of read all of these figures, but just to say there's lots of numbers here. We've done lots of different types of surveys and overall the recovery has been very positive. So I'll show you a few more details. And the first one again is with the scallops. So again, we saw a slow recovery from 2010 to 2013. There wasn't much difference between the, the no-take zone, the protected area and the area that was still fished. But in 2019, we saw a huge increase when we went back after a few years. Um, and in fact, the numbers of scallops now are about four times higher than what they were um, when the area was first protected. In 2019, we also surveyed some areas um, in what we call the fire control, which was the, the more recently protected zone, and then some areas that were still open to fishing. And again, we can see that the mean density of scallops is much, much higher in the area that's um, uh, well protected compared to the fishing ground. In the wider area, the, that much bigger new protected area, we looked at two different types of scallops, um, queens and kings, and the kings have done really well. In just a few years of protection, they've increased sixfold. So it just really shows the incredible ability for species to recover. But the fact that not all of them recover, um, it, you know, these things are complicated. In terms of the seabed, we've also done a lot of analysis of um, images of the seabed and video and things like that. And to sort of put it simply, we've analyzed something like 44 different indices of, of recovery. 36 of them were higher in the protected area compared to the area that was still fished. We saw more juvenile cod and overall an increase in biodiversity of 80%. We've also separately worked with local fishermen to monitor things like the crabs and lobsters. And you can see this, this beast here is you know one of the prime specimens in the protected area and the numbers of uh, uh, lobsters in the protected zone again are much much higher than elsewhere but again it doesn't work for all species some of the other ones are being out competed by these very numerous and fairly fierce large lobsters and on we go we've also worked uh, in conjunction with glasgow university to monitor fish populations using baited video cameras um, and that's revealing all sorts of new things about those uh, species as well. So the story continues. On the back of all of this success, um, 
the community of Aran Seabed Trust has, has received a huge amount of recognition, actually right across the world. And they have now built a uh, marine education center and it was opened by um, the Scottish Environment Minister here, Rosanna Cunningham. And it's a fantastic place. And these actually, even my kids are interested in looking at some of the exhibits, which is quite something. And not only that, it's inspired um, a network of other communities around Scotland, the Coastal Communities Network. There's now 15 different groups uh, illustrated by these dots who are doing, trying to do similar things to what happened on the Isle of Arran. We've also seen around the UK a huge number of uh, now, since when I started, when there were no marine protected areas, a huge increase now. Now there's still a way to go. Not all of these are well protected, but things are moving in the right direction. So finally, Brexit. Um, now, talking about ocean optimism, you might be surprised that I've included this, but it was highly topical, um, as everyone knows, and fishing, um, somehow achieved an incredible profile in all of the Brexit, both uh, debate before the referendum and then afterwards. I mean, who can forget this flotilla on the Thames? It was quite something. The fact this photo is from the New York Times sort of says it all. And of course, uh, there were certain very enthusiastic supporters who said how wonderful it would be for the British fishing industry. Uh, has it worked out that way? Well, a couple of uh, things just to quickly show you, and this is some research I did um, during the period after the uh, Brexit vote, but before we got the deal. Now there's lots on this table, but the key sort of take home positive message is that we surveyed all these different groups and unanimously all of them rated as their top priority sustainable fisheries and strong governance and well enforced management. And that may not have been the case sort of 10 years ago. So obviously, um, those of us in the UK know that there was a fairly torturous route between the vote and the final trade deal, but eventually it was achieved on Christmas Eve. Boris even wore a fish tie on the occasion of announcing it to illustrate, you know, how much a role fish played in all the negotiations. So is there any good news? Now I should say that the deal has not delivered what the industry hoped. And there, there have been a lot of complications with um, particularly trading with the EU. It's, it's become much more difficult and I do really feel for the industry. But from a sustainability point of view, there has been some really positive moves. There's a commitment um, that's shared by the UK and the EU that's tied in that they shall uh, keep the fish stocks at a sustainable level that produces maximum sustainable yield. And there's lots of other good stuff in the agreement as well about being precautionary, taking a long term view, using the best available science, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not what everybody wanted, but there are there is from a sustainability point of view, a lot of good news. It, the Brexit vote has also um, allowed the UK to take more control over management of its seas. And one of the first things that the government has started to do is to be more ambitious with the protection of those marine protected areas that we saw in that, that previous map. In the past, they had to agree any measures in there with all of the relevant countries from Europe, whereas now they can make decisions independently and uh, so far, the UK government is, is showing itself to be quite ambitious in the way that it's moving forward on that. So that's the end of my sort of uh, success stories. And I just thought I'd finish with, you know, a couple of top tips. And some of you are probably very familiar with this, but things that you can personally do to try and do your bit for the ocean. So combating climate change is a key one. Um, and there are lots of simple things you can do here, rethinking your travel, taking public transport, riding your bike, walking, etc. Increasing the efficiency of your home, whether you're heating it or cooling it, even eating less meat. Now, I, I actually like to eat meat, but, you know, I'm trying to eat less, trying to only maybe eat it three times a week or something like that. Um, and, you know, I'm, it's OK. It's, it's not as bad as I thought. If you are going to eat seafood, then choose sustainable seafood. Look for 
um, products that are certified by things like the Marine Stewardship Council or take advice from the Marine Conservation Society's Good Fish Guide. Reduce your waste and if you live by the sea, get out there, get involved in things like beach cleaning and just get out there and enjoy it because, you know, if you get to experience how wonderful the ocean is and how wonderful the marine life in it is, then you will appreciate it and you will want to take action. So I'll leave you with that and uh, my sort of thought for the day, if you like, um, my philosophy inspired by a scallop, uh, which I <laughs> must admit I dreamt up at a conference bar a, a few years ago, but it seems to have uh, touched a few people. So take that thought with you. And other than that, thanks very much for listening. Cheers. Thank you very much indeed um, for um, um, a very interesting talk. We have one or two questions coming in um, and I would encourage people to um, type in the, the question that is in their minds um, and, and put it in. I will do my best to um, compare it and, and, and put them um, to Bryce. First of all, Bryce, if I might ask, um, dealing with um, somebody's asked what what on earth happened to all that rubbish on the beach that um, you had in your photograph and um, indeed why didn't it uh, w weren't there more waves of rubbish coming thereafter so I mean I don't claim to have uh, in-depth knowledge of that beach situation but I guess the the main point is that it would have gone into landfill so the real key way to address issues like that is not for us to be throwing away so much in the first place. So, you know, not to be relying so much on single use plastics, um, just in general, reusing things, not using as much packaging, you know, not everything has to be as packaged as people think it does. Um, but then of course, also disposing of it um, responsibly. So yes, they there would have been more waste coming in, I'm pretty sure. But fortunately, in that particular case, uh, there was an army of people who were cleaning it up and sort of keeping it at bay. Thank you. Um, from Canada, you have a question, which is that they understand that the deep Mariana Trench has higher levels of overall pollution in certain regions than some of the most polluted rivers in Asia. Why? So I, I've heard definitely that there is, you know, uh, things that find their way right down into the bottom of the trenches. Um, I, I don't know if, I haven't heard that particular comparison, but I guess the, the thing about the deepest areas of the sea is that, you know, everything's gonna end up there you know, just the laws of gravity. So, you know, things that are dropped in the in the shallow ocean will eventually float down and, and keep going down and, and eventually they'll get to the deepest part. Whether or not um, there'd be really high concentrations, I guess we know it's there, but, you know, that's one of the most uh, least explored parts of, of the world. I mean, people say, you know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about deep oceans. So, I think there's still a lot to learn about what's down there. But the fact that there is, you know, there's plastic pollution we know in the deep sea is is a sad, sad indictment of our times, really. Yeah. Thank you. Um, fascinated by your um, description of scallops and scallop fishing, is there another method that fishermen can use to collect scallops instead of dredging? as that method produces high amounts of underwater noise and impacts the marine ecosystems that live on the seabed. Yeah, so there are other methods. Um, other places, or even in the UK to an extent, um, there's scuba diving for scallops, which has a much lower impact. The challenge, I guess, is a lot of the areas around the UK where scallops occur are too deep for scuba diving. And the sort of volumes that you can produce are much lower so there is a big demand for scallops um, people may be surprised to learn scallop fishing is the most valuable of all fisheries in England and third most valuable in the UK overall so it's an important industry but another way is aquaculture so actually in China and Japan 
and even in Chile as well, they're very, very successful with growing scallops um, in suspended culture and nets and on lines. And that is actually a, a great way forward because obviously you have fairly limited impact on the environment, um, but the scallops themselves actually filter the water. So they take excess nutrients out of the water and they even absorb carbon. So they act as something like a carbon sink and make something of a contribution to tackling climate change as well. Thank you. Um, James and Joanna Finley have asked, do you have any comment to make on the effects of commercial salmon farming on the wild North Atlantic salmon? Yeah, salmon farming is uh, something of a controversial industry um, and there definitely have been some negative effects. Um, Salmon farming can, I guess, in terms of salmon, be a problem when the, the farm salmon escape and then they can spread diseases to the wild stocks. And also if they interbreed with them, um, they can reduce the genetic diversity because farm salmon are, are, are selectively bred. And so they're quite genetically similar to one another. And so when they interbreed with wild stocks, they can cause problems. There can also be um, localized pollution from salmon farming and use of chemicals like antibiotics that can cause problems as well. So, you know, uh, there's quite a lot of research out there indicating now that salmon farming in the UK needs to address a number of the issues that it's caused. And so I'm hoping that that will, will be the case. Thank you. Um, can aquaculture help to meet the demand for seafood without damaging the oceans further? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the honest answer is that it, it has to, because even if we sort of maximize the efficiency of our management of wild fisheries, they can't produce that much more than they already are. Because like I said, most fisheries are already being um, exploited at maximum capacity or even overfished. So even if we really got everything going well, we might produce another five or 10% more fish, but that would be probably it. So with a glo growing global population, we, we need to turn to aquaculture more. Um, and there are ways forward to make it better. We can tighten up some of the existing um, things that we're doing. We can do more uh, shellfish farming, like I said, with the scallops, that that actually has a net positive um, uh, effect on the environment. We can start farming things like seaweed or what they call multi-trophic farming. So you've, you, you set up almost mini ecosystems. So you don't just farm one species, you farm other things at the same time that clean up the waste of maybe the salmon farming. Um, and then you can also, uh, what's becoming more popular is to move salmon farming and other species on land. And so you actually remove the issue of pollutants going out into the sea and diseases being spread and things like that. So there's no one simple solution, but there's, there's a lot of different ways that we could improve aquaculture. And, and that's really what we're going to have to do to meet the demands of the growing global human population. Um, do you have any view on chemical uh, pharmace pharmaceutical pollution in o oceans um, and particularly its potential impact on reproductive biology? Um, and um, connected to that, are you worried about micro plastic microparticles in the future and their effect on fish stocks? So the pharmaceutical pollution... I mean, we know that it's it's a problem in certain areas. It's not really my area of key expertise, but we know that certain rivers have very, very high uh, levels of pharmaceuticals, for example. Some of, in some parts of the world, you know, there's more pharmaceuticals in the in the rivers than you would get if you took antibiotics every day through <laughs> a couple of pills. And so, of course, what's in rivers ends up in the sea. And so this this can't be a good thing. Um, and it, it is something that needs to be tackled at source. In terms of microplastics, they are, you know, a very um, 
insidious problem because even all of the large plastic that goes into the ocean breaks down eventually into microplastics. And so we know that microplastics are everywhere in the ocean. And, you know, you can pretty much guarantee if you dissect particularly things that feed on the seabed, things like, um, you know, prawns or bottom feeding fish, that they will have microplastics in their stomachs. What we don't really know yet is just how bad that is. You know, if they're just sort of inert particles that get passed out and sort of cycle around, or if they actually block stomachs and reduce the ability to feed, or indeed what they might also do is um, transmit uh, chemical pollution as well, because plastic takes up certain toxins and that, you know, that's, um, that's a concern as well. So it's an ongoing field of research, very active ongoing field of research. And yeah, I don't really have all the answers. It would be better if they weren't there though. You know, <laughs> they're not a natural substance. So I mm. guess that's the bottom line. We have a question from Joe Horsley. Um, what percentage of the global catch is wasted and thrown away? And how do you stop that? Is there legislation in certain parts of the world? Yeah, so the estimates these days are, uh, it's probably about eight to 10% on average, but it's highly variable. So some fisheries, it's, it's really high. Um, certain things like shrimp trawling in the tropics, for example, can have, you know, very, very high levels of bycatch. Um, and a lot of that is thrown away. We probably don't have perfect data on it. Um, but in other fisheries, they're very clean. And so they just really catch what they're after. If we think about a lot of people like to eat tuna, for example, um, pole and line caught tuna is very selective because they're literally just catching the tuna and nothing else. So there's a lot of variation. In other fisheries, not much is wasted, but that's not necessarily a good thing because you know, small fish and vulnerable species are being taken and eaten as well. And so that's not ideal either. So it's, it's a really big issue. As to what to do about it, um, it's a matter of developing both selective gears and selective behavior. And, and there has been a huge amount of work on this. So one of the, I think one of the most successful adaptations has been a thing called a TED, which means turtle excluder device. And these are flaps um, that are put into trawl nets. And if a turtle is accidentally caught in the trawl net, it hits a grid that's in the net that allows the main catch of fish or prawns or whatever to go through. But it sort of shoots the turtle up and out an escape hatch. And these things are fantastically successful. And, and if, a, if a trawl net is fitted with a TED, it basically doesn't catch any turtles at all. So that's the sort of approaches that we need to be thinking about, you know, more of these technological innovations. Thank you. Bearing in mind um, that time is limited, I'm gonna try rather ineptly to combine two questions um, in the same. Um, Peter has asked, why, why is seagrass in decline worldwide? And is it practical to plant seagrass? And um, uh, Dennis Little has asked, what role does seaweed play in the health of the seas? What, what can we do about um, encouraging um, some of the natural um, uh, organisms to, to help um, with um, the, the sea? Sure. So seagrass is a really, really important habitat. Um, it provides a fantastic uh, nursery area for many species and particularly important commercial species like cod, for example. But possibly even more important, it absorbs huge amounts of carbon. So it's, it's per unit area, it's something like 40 times more efficient at absorbing carbon than a rainforest because it has very deep roots that bind the sediment together and store carbon. But as was noted, unfortunately, it's declined um, tremendously in many areas, not just the UK, but all over the world. Probably a range of issues, but maybe the, the worst one is um, siltation from coastal development. So dredging, um, 
for example, building things on land, uh, you know, um, uh, damaging rivers so that more silt goes into the sea, but also just pollution from industry as well. And all of that is bad for seagrass. It's very sensitive to that sort of thing. It relies on light. And so when the water's dirty, it it's, doesn't get enough light and it dies off. So that's been a real problem. Um, and can we restore it? Well, yes, you can replant it, but it's very painstaking. It's a bit like you know, planting a football over one blade of grass at a time. So it can be done, but it's hugely time consuming and labor intensive. Um, and of course, you need to, if you're going to replant, you need to sort of stop the problems that caused it to be lost in the first place. So you need to take it, you know, it's, it was, it is difficult to be honest, but there are some good projects going on. There's an organization called Progr Project Seagrass in the UK which is having quite a lot of success in Wales and doing this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got to do everything we can. As for seaweed, again, or algae, um, as it's sort of technically called, again, it's very, very important as a habitat and also for storing carbon. It is being lost, particularly some of the big species because of climate change. Again, it's quite sensitive to temperature. And so I guess the bottom line with that is that we need to we need to address climate change. You know, we all need to do what we can, uh, and the time is now. So building on that, and we won't spend too much longer. But um, why do you think marine cons conservation efforts on Aran gain such a high profile, and what do we learn from that for the future? Yeah, it is quite a remarkable story. So. I mean, Howard Wood, who was one of the founders of that organization, Coast, he, uh, he was awarded an OBE in 2015, and he was also awarded the Goldman Environment Prize, which um, people may not be familiar with, but it's the largest um, grassroots environmental prize in the world. He was invited to the White House to meet President Obama. Unfortunately, Obama was called away at the last minute, but they also... Um, made a film about him with Robert Redford narrating and things like this. So he's become something of a celebrity. I think what it was, was the fact that it was just a couple of regular guys. Howard, it was a gardener. His, his friend Don was an engineer, um, but they were hugely and still are hugely passionate about the marine environment. And they managed to get their local community behind them. And I think that's the story that appealed to everybody. And so, you know, even though initially they just got a small area of sea protected, it gained a huge amount of attention. And, and I guess more than anything, they provided inspiration. And they showed that, um, to, to sort of coin a phrase we used in the paper uh, that summarized everything, marine conservation starts at home, you know, protect your local environment. And if everyone does that, then the world will be a better place. Thank you. Final question, um, which is centered around a, a specific question that somebody's asked, um, will robotics have much impact on aquaculture? But um, perhaps turning that, uh, broadening that a little more, what do you see as being the greatest hope for science and it's um, over the next 10 years, what is most likely to have the most impact? Gosh, that's a big question. I think there's two answers. One is the fact that we are starting to recognize the real importance of interdisciplinary science and, and bringing together the sort of biological and the social sciences. So the management of, of marine environments is really about people. You know, a lot of people, I'm a marine biologist, but I'm happy to admit that the biology will take care of itself if you can make sure that people are treating the, the marine environment with respect and using it sustainably. So we really need to embrace that side of things and to work for, for scientists, fishermen, conservationists, anglers, everyone to work much more closely together and build up trusting relationships. From a technological point of view, something that's really exciting has been the increased actual use of robotics and 
machine learning. And so we have the ability now to gather data um, at a scale that was previously thought impossible. And so we have now, for example, uh, uh, there's a thing called Ar Argos floats, which are out there all over the world's oceans at the moment, 4,000 of them collecting real-time data on things like temperature and pressure and salinity. And that is allowing us to, to forecast changes in ocean currents and the world's climate at a scale that was never thought possible. So use of that technology is really advancing the science base as well. So we need to bring all of that information and that science together with people, with the users of the marine environment, communicate it clearly and respectfully. And I think, you know, we can move forward from there. Thank you, Bryce. With any good talk, um, you have to cut it off at a moment when everybody is wanting more. And there are a lot more questions um, that people are asking. And uh, to the people who are listening in the UK or worldwide, um, I'm terribly sorry if I haven't um, asked your question. I'm sure Bryce would be happy to do so afterwards by uh, email. Um, sure. And um, but 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 thank you for asking them. There's a there's a long list of them. To our audience as well, I would like to apologise that um, normally, if you were in the hall, I'd immediately invite you all down for a drink. Um, and some little sustenance um, with us. Um, of course, we can't do that, so that's rather sad, um, but hopefully we'll see you in York another time. Um, to Bryce, on behalf of everybody who's been listening this evening and uh, the Merchant Adventurers, um, thank you so much for a very topical, very interesting, very understandable talk. Um, I don't think any of us will look at um, a scallop on our um, plates <laughs> um, quite the same way. Again, we'll be measuring them and wondering whether the restaurant has got the right ones, whether they come from the Isle of Man or where they come from. And, <laughs> and thank you for um, giving us such a fascinating talk. Thank you. It was a real pleasure and honour to be here. And thanks, everybody, for listening and all of your great questions. <laughs>